Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform and the details for that are below in the description. We wanna be praying for you and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. Heavenly Father, to walk in your ways, your plan, your purpose, and to shelter under your everlasting wings is our desire. With you, every challenge which stands in our way melts little by little over time or it suddenly disappears. With you, Lord, that which was not possible becomes possible. In all we face, we stand patient and secure in Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Father, this year we have declared that we will stand in one heart, one mind, one spirit and one purpose. We know this to be your will for us as your written word makes this clear. In this unity, we do not cease from being the unique individuals you have made us to be with talents and personalities and opportunities provided by you to achieve godly productivity in our lives activity that brings joy to your heart. To be one in heart and mind and spirit and purpose is to be like individual fibres woven together to make a strong and durable fabric. Each strand is important to the whole, gives strength to the whole. A beautiful and useful fabric might receive texture and colour from individual threads but it is the designer who coordinates the finished look. Weave us together, Lord. May your word guide us, your Holy Spirit empower us, and may the name of Jesus be constantly on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, I ask something special for 2022. Nathan has laboured in this fellowship for seven years. Lord, we ask that 2022 would eclipse all of the last seven years. We ask that 2022 be the year of spiritual flood, of overflow. Pour out your spirit upon us as never before. We don't ask primarily for ourselves, but we wish to align ourselves with your will. We ask for your heart to be reflected in our hearts. We ask for release for spiritual captives and sight for the blind, spiritual or otherwise. Blessing for all who will receive. The work of our Lord Jesus manifest in our midst in ever-increasing abundance. Your abundant blessing is never lacking, but our willingness to take it up is often in doubt. Help us to remove all blockages which prevent us from receiving all you offer. Seven years eclipsed by 2022 for your glory. This is what we ask. Let the name of Jesus be like a giant banner flying above Orange Baptist Church. Not the building of brick and mortar we meet in, but the building of heart and mind and spirit and purpose. Lord, whatever hurts, grievances, lack of knowledge or wisdom, any negative self-talk which holds us back and all physical and mental ailments, we give them all over to you. 
We declare that from this day forth, we choose to walk in purity, in love and in unity, more so than we have done previously, so that our great and good God will be honoured in our homes and throughout the community of Orange and beyond. We pray that the standard of Jesus, that spiritual flag flying above us, and the empowering presence of your Holy Spirit within would draw multitudes to Jesus. Put Jesus on our lips. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, 12 to 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose, his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Father, now as we come to your word, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that not only that through your son that we've been redeemed, uh, but that you just haven't left us alone, but by your spirit, you continue to do a work in us. Lord, please do your work in us fully. That we as a community of faith would take your word seriously and that we would live it out empowered by you, Holy Spirit. That we wouldn't be settled for the status quo, that we wouldn't be seekers of our own comfort, but we would be pursuers of your glory and joy. Lord, teach us now what it means to be a community of faith. Teach us what it means to live out discipleship together. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we pursue this, um, this theme that, that is is really prevalent here in in the book of Philippians. As we pursue this oneness, oneness of mind and heart and of spirit and of purpose, uh, this is nothing new. Um, And and I'm I'm sure you've heard it and and seen it. And I'm sure for many of us, we we know that this is what we're called to. And so I started to wonder this week, well, what stops us? What, What stops us truly as disciples of Jesus who have been, received, have been saved by his grace and renewed by his spirit, what stops us from living out this oneness collectively? We're good at living out our own singularity, but what stops us from being joined together and, and living out of this faithfulness? What stops us from pursuing God together? I think there's a, a couple of reasons I think there's a couple of reasons, and one of which I think, if if you're anything like me and you you battle kind of anxiety anyway, I think think there's another part of that, that anxiety wells up with inside of us, and and so we struggle in our own relationship with God, uh, because we kind of question whether he loves us and whether he's with us, and then we we battle our anxiety around being in community and, and being vulnerable and opening ourselves up the way that the Scriptures clearly Tell us to. And so we guard ourselves a little bit. And really, I get to the heart of that and I thought, well, that's really only our own challenges, our own difficulties, perhaps our own pride at times that stop us from pursuing faithful Christianity and enjoying all of the blessings and joys that come with that. Then then I started to think, well, What else could stop us in that? Well, I think there was a rise throughout church history uh, with with a movement around, uh, around, centred around kind of quiet Christianity. The quietists, if you will. And there's a thing inside of Christianity that the 
the point where our faith was a silent faith. It was an internal faith. You didn't talk about politics or religion, but you had a deep faith and it was a quiet faith that existed inside of you. And so you really went at it as a bit of a lone ranger. And it was, this was taught. More than that, it was also taught that you don't just jump in and, and, and kind of do all these things that God is calling you to, uh, that you have a hunch about, unless God speaks to you in the most incredible of ways. So in other words, we sit passively until such time as God does something incredible like flashing neon lights. And until the flashing neon lights come, we just sit and be silent. And in that, we just abdicate any kind of sense of responsibility around pursuing God and His goodness and, in fact, what God is calling us to in the world around us. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other ways in which we... Um, make up and we hide behind in pursuit of God. We hide behind them and they, they kind of, they're almost acceptable in our own society, whether that is our own anxiety and then we just hide behind that and say, I'm too busy or whether that is the quietness inside of us and, and, and we'd rather be introverted and, and not actually take the steps of engaging in community and we just want to have a quiet faith and live on the side. I'm sure there's a whole myriad of other elements to this, but whatever that is, one thing is certain is that in all of those things, we are failing to receive the fullness in which God has for us, both as individual disciples and what that then means for the collective of disciples that is the church. And so in the end, we find ourselves living a half-baked life. And when we actually sell ourselves short and we remove the riches of God's grace even in our own lives. And that to me seems a little odd particularly for people who want comfort and joy. Maybe then we've just been pursuing comfort and joy and hope in all the wrong things. So as we kick into this year, we have to be bold and courageous enough to take God's word seriously and genuinely pursue oneness together in Christ. Whatever stops us, Philippians here has a lot to teach us. It has a lot to shape us. If we will allow the Spirit to speak to us, which really I should put it a different way. We should allow ourselves to listen to the Holy Spirit and not ignore Him. Maybe that's more what needs to take place. Paul begins this incredible section here in Philippians 2.12. With this statement, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. We get this first little section, and that really is the therefore. We see that in verse 12, straight off the bat. And Paul links us back to what he has just said. What Paul has just said is what we looked at last week around the nature of the gospel and the bringing together of oneness to pursue oneness together, one in heart and with mind. And then he unpacks that even further in a section that we didn't look at in verses 5 through to 11 and the implication of what this oneness looks like in our pursuit of relationships with one another. And this forms the foundation for what Paul is saying now. And so we go back and we, we read this most incredible passage of Scripture. Sometimes Scripture is, is, is cause for us to, to be reflective and uh, to confess. And other times it's about teaching. Other times we read it and we are supposed to see and experience this incredible God that we serve. And we're supposed to read it and be wowed by it. Philippians 2, 5 to 11 is one of those sections that we are to be wowed by. This is what it says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. 
by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In this pursuit of oneness together, this is how the very basis of our relationships are to look. They're to look like this subservient, gracious, humbled nature in which we engage with one another just like Jesus did himself who did not see the fact that he is God, something to be withheld, but he came in the human likeness. He took on human flesh. He left the throne room of heaven to pursue us, humbling himself in pursuit of his people, willingly sacrificing himself. We just celebrated that. Willingly sacrificing himself, allowing his body to be broken, pouring out his blood. And this is to be reflected in the way that we live with one another. That's what Paul is getting at. There's no question that the very basis of this is how we are to live collectively as disciples in God's community. There's no question. But it's amazing how Paul goes into this incredible detail to unpack that. And I think there's a rhetorical device in here in which Paul is absolutely saying we need to be gracious with one another and serving one another and humbling ourselves before one another at every point along the way. But as he's doing that, he's also lifting our rise to the glory of Jesus, to be mesmerised again, to give us the very basis for which we interact with one another. But more than that, he gives us the very basis on how we are to interact with this very one. Which is why Paul continues on in verse 9 when he says, Therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is absolutely, there's no question that Paul is going, we need to have relationships in the kingdom of God, in the the church itself. We are to be one in heart, mind, purpose and spirit. Absolutely. And the way that we do that is that we live out of Jesus' character, that we humble ourselves in our own pursuit of relationships. And we do that because Jesus is Lord. But we, we pursue him. We live out of obedience in the way that we interact with one another and love one another and serve one another because of who Jesus is. And here we are to see that Jesus is the name above all names. Jesus is the one where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord. The King of the world, ruler over all, including... You and me. So when we look in the mirror and we go, I am mine. No, that's not true. No, I am bought with a price. I am Jesus's. And for us, we know this. And for mostly, I think we're happy to bow our knee and can tongues confess that Jesus is Lord. And I actually wonder more than that. I think we're happy to confess Jesus is Lord. The bending of the knee thing, that's the challenge, right? That's really the challenge for us as disciples, right? Because when we bow the knee, we are saying, we will do whatever it is you want us to do because you are God. You with me? So we're happy to confess it. The hard thing is that our own knees will bow. But there is this statement that is very clear made by Paul that every knee and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord, willingly or even unwillingly, in heaven and on earth and those even under the earth. There is coming a time where we will stand before this risen King, this Lord of all creation, the one whose name is above all else, and we will declare that He is Lord and King. He is Saviour and Master. And if this is going to be the case, if everyone's going to do it, then we who should know Him should be ready to say, Lord, I am yours. And when He then says, why should I allow you into my kingdom? We go, because you're my everything. You're my everything. 
You're my Lord, you're my Savior, you're my King, and in you I pursue good things, good things that you have designed for me. Things in which I humble myself and I don't hide behind. I, I just want you. You, you know what's not going to happen? We're not going to get before the throne room of God. And Jesus says, why should I allow you into my kingdom? And we go, well, I got to see most of Australia in a caravan. Oh, oh you should see when I died, I had this really big bank account. I worked really hard for that. It's it quite impressive, Lord. I, you know. I couldn't do all the things that you wanted me to do because I was really just kind of busy doing this over here. You know, I was, you know, I was taking care of my kids and just, you know, doing work and, and, you know, building my little nest eggs and trying to, you know, feather my nest. Look at all the, the wealth I amassed. Look at all of the time that I had and all of the things that I did. And at that moment, if, if, if that's the case, then we've just been pursuing fool's gold. That doesn't cut it, does it? That doesn't cut it before the King of kings and Lord of lords. The one who humbled himself and leaving the throne room of heaven in pursuit of his own people. And those of us who have experienced his grace. And yet, inside of that, go, ah, I just don't have time. I just, you, know, you know, it's just a busy season. I love that. It's just a busy season in my life. Yeah, yeah, every, every season's busy. It's about choice, isn't it? It's a, I suppose it's about priorities, isn't it? I know it's uncomfortable. I, I'm not just preaching at you. <laughs> I find this uncomfortable too. But every knee is going to confess. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So I guess we're going to have to give an account at one point or another. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to live this out? How do we continue to pursue this oneness because of Jesus and his glory and his magnificence? Paul helps us uh, along that way. And he begins here in verses 12 to 13 when he says, Therefore, my dear friends, if you have always obeyed, not only my presence but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In light of this God and this majesty and the fact that we're going to bend our knee, we need to continue together in obedience, working out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Now, now part of that is, is it's a little subtle. And we need to get a hold of this. What, what Paul is not saying is that we need to work for our salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. We, we know that. We know that we've been saved by grace alone, in Christ alone. We know that his death is effective for us. We know that we don't have to work to, show, to find and to seek God's favour. But rather, because of God's grace and his mercy, because of his favour that has been shown to us, we are to pursue living out of obedience, working out what it means to truly be saved, to truly live as citizens of the kingdom of God. That's what Paul's saying. We need to work out how to live out of this salvation with fear and with trembling. What's interesting is that Paul isn't addressing the Philippians as just individuals. He's not naming each one of the people. He's calling on the community itself. That there's a, there's a collective here that we together, Paul is saying, together as the body work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. This isn't a solo sport. You have to do it together. This is how, and as we work through what does it mean for us to, to submit ourselves to God? What does it mean for us to live as a community of faith faithfully? What does it mean for us together to, to live out of this incredible salvation in which we have? That's what Paul's calling for. And he's calling for it out of obedience. He's just telling the Philippian church, continue to walk in obedience to the things that God has commanded. 
to continue to love him and to serve him and to have no other gods before him, to continue to love our neighbours as ourselves, to continue to give voice to the voiceless and to take care of the marginalised and, and to bless those who are struggling. That's part of that, but it's also to love and to provide and to nurture one another, by which I mean we don't just rub each other's backs and say, there, there, poor you. We point each other, even in the hard times, to Jesus. That's that's real pastoral care, by the way. Real pastoral care is to sit with a brother and sister and point them, even in the midst of pain and suffering and difficulty and strife, and be brave enough to point them and to help lift their eyes to Jesus. We are to work out our salvation together. What does this mean for us to live as a collective of disciples for the glory of Jesus? That's what we've got to work out. And we do it with fear and trembling. And I think that's a couple of different ways inside of that. I I, I don't think it just means that we are to be quivering in our boots because somehow God is going to smite us if we don't. But rather I think what it is is to recognise who Jesus is. And when you recognise that Jesus is God, that means that you are not and that we are subservient to him. There's a sense of awe and like trembling of like, you are so holy and so good and what you demand of me is fair. There's a sense in which if we don't have a a holy fear of God, then then, then, do do we really grasp his power and his authority? Do we really grasp who he is? And I think more than that, I think there is this element of fear and trembling in the fact that we might not live out of faithful Christianity. And again, that's going to be exposed when we stand before him and we bend our knee and confess him as Lord. Do you see what I mean here? And so there is a fear that we might just live this life in this pursuit of our own comforts and we don't know when our life will be demanded of us, and we, but we know it, it's going to happen. And we get to the end of that and again we stand before God and what answer do we give him? What answer do we give him and what we did with our life for his glory? Again, what are you going to show him? He's not interested in materials. He wants this. He wants all of this and all of you. And we had to work this out together, walking side by side, pursuing Jesus together, working it out together. What are we as Orange Baptist Church, what are we called to do as a community of faith? And each one of us has our part to play. Gary prayed this beautifully already. We we are individuals. We are made up uniquely by God. We know that the psalmist has told us that we have been meticulously made by God in our mother's wombs. We are all individuals. But like various different pieces of materials, we have stitched together, as we're braided together, we live out of the very purpose in which God has for us. And what happens if... We don't do that. We fray at the edges. We fray at the edges. We have to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling because God is already at work in us. Our response isn't to make stuff up and go, this is what I'm going to do for God. Rather, it's to be listening and to be obedient to what Jesus is already doing. Take a look in verse 13. This is what it says. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to dream up what you're going to do to please Jesus. You don't. What we do need to recognise is that God is already at work in us. What we're called to do is to be obedient to what he's saying to us. And so then it makes me kind of wonder if you go, well, I don't know what God calling, God's calling for me to do. I don't know what I should do. And so I just fall back into that kind of quietest kind of process and I, I just wait for the neon flashing lights. I don't think we actually do. 
Here's what I think actually happens. We go, we, aren't listening, we, we can't hear God is because we take this index finger and this index finger and we jam them really hard into our ears. And, and even in the muffle, we start to hear the Spirit speak and to do our responses then. La, 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 la. So we just kind of block him out at every point along the way. It's kind of like, well, that's inconvenient. God, you're inconvenient. I'm just going to shove my fingers in my ear. I'm just going to do this. And then, and then you get convicted of that and you go, well, I need to make up for it. I need to make up for it. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to make something up. That's not what it's called, what it's called here. We need to recognise that our, our action towards God is always a reaction to what he's been doing first. Always. Did you see it in verse 13? We do the works of God because he's the one who's worked in us first. The desires that spring forth within us for the glory of God and for the building of his community of faith are God's promptings. You are just called to respond to that. And this is how it's always been. Even our own salvation is a response to God's love first. Take a look, you look at 1 John, and this is what it says, 1 John 4, 19. We love, that is, we love God because he first loved us. We respond to God's activity in our lives, and he is acting. So if we're not responding, it's not because he's not doing anything. It's because we are refusing to listen. And at that, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is at work. He wants good things for us. He wants his good things for us. And we need to want his good things. It's the best we can have. Isn't it? Surely. He goes even further in this. He makes it really clear that as we do this, as we prompt, as as we say yes to the promptings of God, we do so, we are to do so with a glad and thankful heart in the midst of all of this. This is what he says in verse 14 through to verse 16a. He says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Some of us, some of us in love, we need to take hold of this statement right here, right, this verse. Trust me, I know because I've had conversations with you and I've received some emails. So with this, with this, at this moment, I just, just, for, for, for me as well, trust me, trust me, it's for me. Uh, there's times where I'm going to be grumbling and arguing. But here, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. So as we pursue God and we live out of this faithfulness, do you know what we're not to do? Argue and grumble. Oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I'm going to do this. It's always so busy. It's, just, oh, it's like, it's just so inconvenient. I've just got to do it. I've just, you know, I don't like doing it. I've just got to do it. Just, you know, I wish someone else would do it. No one else serves. No one else does this. So I've just got to do everything. So, who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for other people? Sure, I hope so. But more than that, the, the very things that we do for God is actually f- for God. <laughs> Sounds daft, isn't it? The things that we do for God are actually... For God, it's for his glory. He's a moment of confession. Do you know, every time I've gotten to the edge of burnout, if I'm being honest, it's because I've been working. I've just been pushing hard, pushing hard, pushing hard. I have not been sitting here. And in that moment when I'm just kind of like, why isn't everyone else doing this? And we need to be, and I just get frustrated and grumbling. And I go, oh, I just don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard. It felt like that. If you need a cure for a faithful life, joy-filled and hopeful, if you need a cure for that, grumble and argue. There you go. There's something to take home. If you need a cure for a decent life, just argue and grumble. Some of us, this is how we live all the time, grumbling and arguing. And then we wonder why we don't enjoy God and His people. But it's to our benefit that we don't argue and grumble. If you look here, look at the benefit of it. That's what he says here. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that, so you don't do this so that you can receive. What are you going to receive? So that you may become blameless and pure 
children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. It's a fairly decent trade-off, isn't it? So so if, if arguing and spite and frustration and disappointment and grumbling, if that is the mode in which we live, then it's no wonder we keep falling into sin. It's no, law, it's no wonder why we don't enjoy God and His people. It is therefore no wonder that we don't pursue oneness of mind, heart, spirit and purpose. Because we're just too busy grumbling about the state of our lives, the state of other people, the state of the church, the state of everything. We wonder why we don't live out of joy. And we're just looking, think, think about this. Paul, he quotes Deuteronomy, and I think it's, it's perfectly fitting. Because if you look at the people of God, what do you see at the moment in which God restores them and brings them out of Egypt, of which they see God's mighty activity in a divine tsunami that, that wipes out the Egyptian forces. And they cross over after seeing this divine tsunami. And what do they do? They sing, they sing and they praise God. And you think, wow, they've got it, right? Three days later, three, three. It's like youth kids coming back from a youth camp. Three days later, what does Israel do? Grumble, moan, complain. I wish we were still back in Egypt. At least their stones hurt enough to quickly get over the pain. What has God brought us out here for? So we can die? They just complain, grumble, complain. And do you know what that grumbling and complaining got them? What should have taken 40 days took them a little longer. If we're going to be the people of God then we have to have a right perspective of who Jesus is and we have to have a good perspective, a holy perspective of each other as we pursue obedience, working out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Not in arguing, not in grumbling. And then he says this in the second half in verse 16. He says, as you hold firmly to the word of life, Sorry, he says, then you shall shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Again, here the implication is if we don't grumble, if we receive the good things, we shine like stars in the night sky. And what is the purpose of stars shining in the night sky? What does the psalmist tell us? To display the glory of God. When we live out of faithfulness, We live out of the pursuit of Jesus in the life of his community. We shine like stars in this dark world. And as we shine, we shine the glory of God and his beauty and his majesty and his holiness. And as we do that, we need to do so holding firmly to the word of life. And as we do that, Paul then says, then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. As we hold on to the the word of truth, as we live out of this faithfulness, as as we do so with glad and thankfulness in our hearts, we shine like stars to the world around us. But do you know what we also seek to do? In that, we become an encouragement to one another and to the rest of the communities of faith. It becomes a moment of encouragement, what Paul is saying here, as the one who had founded this church, who had planted this church, who's worked with them and the the community has loved on him. He wants them to continue to pour out their lives as a sacrifice. And so Paul wants to see that as a celebration and a thanksgiving. And more than that, it's like he becomes, his sacrifice becomes an add-on to the sacrifice that they're already giving to the glory of God. In other words, it's like the sacrificial table and, and the church is just pouring out their lives in the service of Jesus and for his glory and Paul goes I'm a part of that my life's poured out on top of that it's like a little bit more and a little bit more and again to the glory of God 
Paul's not boasting in and of himself. He's, he's saying, I, I want my life to be an extra bit of worship to Jesus as your life is too. And that's why he says here, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. It is your faith. It is your service that Paul finds encouragement from. And so it is to be with us. As we look upon one another and we see the service that each one of us has gladly and willingly for the glory of God, it serves as a reminder and brings us joy and thankfulness that we are in this together, willingly sacrificing ourselves beautifully and thankfully for the glory of God. This is so vital for us. That's why Paul ends with... I am glad and rejoice with all of you so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. As we do this, as we live this life out, we get to rejoice with one another. Be thankful together for what God is doing in us and through us. I don't want us to be a community that is full of quietists. But I also don't want us to be a community of faith that battles with anxiety, worried about what God is thinking. I want us to be clear in the gospel here. And I want us to love one another and to pursue the glory of God together, living out of faithfulness that we might make a difference for his glory in this world. That's what we're called to. That's what we're called to. But but here's the thing. It's going to take each one of us to do it. We're going to have to lay ourselves down. We're going to have to walk with one another and be humble in our relationships with one another. Just like Jesus. You see how that loops back around? The only way for us to live this out is to be like Christ with one another, walking alongside one another, diverting our eyes, calling out sin, calling out and encouraging one another to again pursue Jesus. And in that, not fighting one another. Not going, how dare you say that? How dare you? They don't know what's going on. Oh, that's so judgmental. No, they probably just hit a nerve. But if we know that we love one another and we're in this together for the glory of Jesus, then hard words are not hard. They're they're taking us thankful. So what do we do with this? What do you do with this? What do I do with this? All I know is whatever it will be, God is the one who makes the way. He's the one who is working. So why don't we take a minute and we sit with this. Maybe pray. Seek the Lord. Say what he say, see what he says to you. Take your fingers out of your ears. And then say, yes, Lord. In obedience that is filled with thankfulness and joy. Let me pray. Lord, help us now. By your spirit, reveal areas of our lives in which we have moved ourselves away from living out of faithfulness. Maybe for some of us, we've we've lost sight of your glory. Perhaps for others, we we have fallen into the, the easy trap of grumbling and arguing. I ask now that through your spirit that you would bring conviction to each one of us.
Lord, by your spirit, give us the courage to step into faithfulness, to delight in obedience. to willingly and gladly choose the path of working out our salvation with fear and with trembling before you, our holy God. Lord, allow us to say yes and to pursue you so that we might truly be blameless and pure that we might shine like stars in the dark night sky, holding firmly to the word of life, declaring your goodness, your greatness, your majesty, your mercy, so that all might see. Amen. He became sin. Who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness? He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Lord 
Senhor, amor. 